So thanks everybody for coming. Uh, this is the second event in a sort of informal series uh, that we're doing. And I say it's informal because we didn't announce it as a series and we don't actually know how many we'll have. We have a few topics in mind. Uh, the what's next series, we want to discuss um, how political movements will uh, sort of readjust uh, or prepare for the new post-COVID world. So last uh, last week we had Brendan O'Neill and uh, he and I discussed what's next for climate alarmists. Uh, and we'll have similar events where there's usually one objectivist and one non-objectivist discuss discussing the topic. So for today's event, uh, the topic is what's next for feminists. And our speakers are uh, Zoe Strimple, who is the non-objectivist on this panel, uh, and uh, Nikos, who is... Uh, the objectivist, and I, I don't want to make a joke about you being the resident feminist, so I'm, I'm going to skip that, and uh, let's get in. Uh, Zoe, the floor is yours. Oh, thanks. Um, well, I thought this was going to be about the future of feminism, not the future for feminists, um, but maybe the, th maybe the two things are the same. I don't know. I guess uh, it's impossible to say in terms of action points, because I don't think... Um, I'm not sure that there are that there were clear action points that were kind of fast changing. So I don't know if it's going to be like post COVID nineteen. We have this, this, and or there is this, this, and this now to do to mess to mop up. Um, I think instead, what's interesting is that this is now raising some pretty meaty. Um, issues that are, are definitely feminist and they have like feminist chops like they go back forever as key core signature feminist issues and um so for instance boris johnson's uh kind of roadmap to baby steps towards out of the darkness of the tunnel or whatever on sunday so obviously what's been very controversial for instance has been who gets, or who is encouraged to go back to work, who can go back to work and what happens with kids. So I think it's really interesting because already whatever you think personally about gender divides and how they're decided in the home, um, what is clearly happening is a lot of women are, for instance, saying this could only have been, you know, this plan could only have been written by, by men um, or at a pinch young, young people without kids. So, so, there's a return to work thing, but school kids, very few school kids can go back to school. Childcare isn't sort of seemingly fully back on. So it begs the question of how do you manage um, parenting and going to work with no childcare? And the implication women are saying seems to be that it'll be the women that as primary, traditionally primary, uh, child care and so on will will have to stay back and not go and things like the school run they you're being encouraged to sort of cycle and so on if you don't have a car that's not going to work for the school run so there's a lot of anger about that but um you know this is this is a meaty whatever you think about it i think this is at least like a good solid classic feminist issue that women are going to have to rethink and it now has focus whereas before i think there was just lots of sort of gripes about um inequalities to do with men being at the top of companies and women not. And it was a bit unclear what was going on and how childcare and so on was being divided. But I think the current, um, the current mess we're in or the current uh, attempts to like grapple our way through the dark has like suddenly forced the issue into the limelight in a really interesting way. Same with this sort of like just the broader rubric, I suppose, this domestic sphere versus public sphere, uh, which you know, this is this is like the classic. So I think that's something um, women can get into if they want and should. I mean, it's it's an interesting one. It's always interesting about who's expected to look after the kids um, and and put their work second. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, I just finally would say that there is there is there are concerns. I don't know if they're justified about those going back to work. Say they're men. The women are at home looking after the kids, being seen as as like being in on certain kinds of network networking and meetings and there being a pecking order whereas where those who actually go in are valued over those who stay at home i don't know if i, I that to me sounds perhaps jumping the gun in terms of like doom about gender but 
you know, then it, there's another kind of very concrete, satisfyingly concrete issue here, which is who is a key worker? Who are the people who have to go back to work? And basically the people Boris Johnson mentioned on Sunday are like people in construction, people in manufacturing. So really what he's thinking of are traditional, basically manual work that men tend to do. And I think it's really interesting that for all our kind of culture wars and sophisticated views about gender and, 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 and indeed like massive amounts of like leaps and bounds in equality and educational attainment, in fact, women do, you know, doing much better, becoming more overly educated or qualified. It's still the situation where the builders and the, and the like the, you know, the, the people driving the trains, um, they and the people who are working in factories and manufacturing, those people that Bar Boris Johnson was thinking of as not being able to do their job at home tend to be men. And there's a class thing there too, I suppose. But the softer jobs, in some ways, some are maybe associated with women. I don't know. I'm, I think that actually does end up falling to pieces in another aspect of the current situation, which is going to force, which is forcing an issue to do with employment, which is, again, and I, you know, there was, so there's a multi-billion, I don't know how big it is, but an enormous part of our economy is to do with um, like beauty, um, so nails, uh, hair salons, spa treatments, yoga, Pilates, sort of the whole well-being sector is essentially women, uh, women's job. I mean, th these are basically women running these things. Um, there are very few male nail salons or I mean I suppose there are male hairdressers around but it's just interesting that they haven't been mentioned so one of the first things that friends of mine were questioning was okay so can hairdresser go to work if your work cannot be done at home can you go to work well if you're a hairdresser your work cannot be done at home does that mean you can go to work so I think that's that's interesting again about like what's women's work what's men's work obviously I'm not saying I'm not saying that there's any kind of law preventing women from being construction workers or lawyers I mean, obviously a lot of women are lawyers or men from being nailed from, I'm just saying that the way the cookie crumbles is still along pretty traditional lines. Okay, a few other meaty issues feminists will have to get stuck into again. Domestic abuse, definitely on the rise. Um, ha, this is an interesting one. Um, so obviously before all this, at the very forefront of what people were thinking about when they were thinking about feminism was the trans stuff. And that was such like, and it's such a vexed issue. It took over everything. It became like the main organizing feature of feminism. Are you a TERF? Are you a trans activist? You know, the Labour Party before Keir Starmer took over had that, that kind of like bill of requirements about trans rights that everyone had to sign up to. And it was, it was a whole thing. Interestingly, obviously with Corona, old hat now, but you know, the, the fact that sex differences have played such a big difference in, in survival rates and the way that actually perhaps people have shelved their insistence on the kind of multi-sex, multi-gender thing for now, because there's such a, like a blatant illustration from nature about the differences between those. Um, and then the final thing I'll just say uh, is that, um, it's quite funny because Me Too was obviously the last big concrete feminist issue that people got behind. But I just don't know what, I wonder what the future of Me Too is now that basically women aren't going into offices, the workplace is in tatters, there's no like pubs or like street life to speak of. Like where are, where can we be harassed? Um, and I, I don't know where, where we can be harassed. Um, and I said that was the final thing and I just have one final thing because I've been thinking about this a lot, I'm gonna get it off my chest. I think feminism should become a little more theoretical and not in the culture war way, but in terms of thinking about things like time. So for women getting to the end of their thirties or into their forties or like, they, we don't have time to spare. Like we are withering on the vine. That's what women are told to believe. Like every minute counts, we lose our, our kind of erotic and sexual and romantic and everything capital declines with our like perceived the natural life of fertility. So say until like your early four, mid forties. So a lot of women who are kind of in their late thirties who are like, okay, the clock has stopped for like an indefinite period. It is a big difference whether you're 35 or 37 or 37 or 39 or 41. Whereas for men, it's just not a big difference. It literally makes no difference. So I've been thinking a lot about time um, and the pressure and the sort of relative time poverty in a sense of women, um, which is not really anyone's fault, uh, but it just is, it kind of, well, it's a well. It just kind of is a. It may be someone's fault, but I think I'll leave it there. I mean, sorry, that was not really long.
Thanks, Zoe. Um, and Nikos, you're next. Anyone who has any doubt on how important hairdressers are, you can just look my, at my haircut, which is the result of me cutting in my hair instead of being able to go to a, to a, to a hairdresser. But anyway, so uh, I, will, I will take a step. I, I will zoom out a bit and I will give more of a general overview of where I see feminism more as a political movement. So Zoe did a very good job in presenting what are, will be or what are already are the struggles of women, of individual women or of groups of women. But I will focus more on feminism as a movement. So I will focus my, let's say, my, what I say on what we saw from the organized political or social movement that we could recognize as, as feminist. So to understand what's next for feminism, we need to ask how the new world will look like. And to use the term that I hate, I, I think it's the worst, the most annoying and the most pessimist term that I've heard in ages, what the new normal will be. And then we will understand what's the future for, for feminism and what will be the new, let's say, divisions. So I think the world that we will be waking up, but actually that we're already in, will be a world of control, will be a world of risk aversion. And it will be a role where individual responsibility will be considered a dirty world. And you can see this already for the last three days. Yesterday, I saw a tweet uh, by one of the biggest radical leftist media organization in this country who said basically that individual responsibility means something like right-wing libertarianism. That individual responsibility means you tell people you go there and you die en masse. So that's the world we're waking up, the world where individual responsibility is now considered something dirty. And this means we will wake up in a more collectivist world. And some people might say, well, collectivism, what does this mean? Like, are you crazy objectivists? No, collectivism means something very specific. It means that your life, your values, your decision, whether that decision would be to open your business or whether you are worried about the clock ticking that Zoe said, or the clock ticking about anything, all these things do not matter or do not have priority. What has priority is the collective, society. And of course, we society, whoever the politicians or the experts or the technocrats tell us that it is. So this is, this is the quote, new normal. And unfortunately, the feminist movement, as it has developed for at least the last three to four decades, will more or less feel at home with this in this world. Of course, with many notable exceptions, with many, I know I'm making a huge generalization. Again, I'm taking this as the movement and with its main characteristics. And actually, it is a movement that, as a technocrat, starts from a premise which is praiseworthy. I want to protect the vulnerable. I want to save lives. Now, I would say immediately that the mere fact that you see that you see the average human person or the average woman as the fact of vulnerable, in my opinion, there's already a huge problem here because this means it says something about how you see the world. But anyway, let's, let's leave this aside for a second. So we, the, the feminist movement has shown a tendency towards more controls in people's behaviors in the last years, in the last decades, often based on fears that have been exaggerated beyond proportion. And again, we see here a parallel between COVID and between the feminist narrative. And an example that comes to mind is the one in four who's going to fall victim of sexual assault narrative, or this idea that the university is this more or less dangerous place for women, which again, it's, very, it's a fear which is very disproportionate and not standing to facts. And we have seen the feminist movement pushing for more controls. And these could be controls that either come from the government, such as, for example, quotas, or this uh, demand for big businesses to, to, to prove how, you know, how, what is the gender pay gap, or uh, how many women they have on their board. 
So controls coming either from the government or from the worst police officer sometimes, which is the police officer in our mind. And I'm talking about this micromanagement of behavior. We see this micromanagement of behavior now with COVID. We see this, the, all this thing about social distancing, which makes sense, but also we see many things that do not make sense. And the same micromanagement of our language, of our gestures, of how we stare at someone, of how we should talk, on how we should even pursue our most intimate moments, how after every step on the sexual process, you should specifically do this and do that. And of course, all this comes from something that is obviously very healthy, which is that there should, be, there should always be consent. Of course, we, we, this, is, this is correct. But when this is translated to this micromanagement, to this Foucauldian governance, so to speak, this kind of biopolitics in steroids, then this is a problem. And this is, again, a narrative that has been present in the feminist movement, and this is also going to be something which is very present in the post-crisis world. And also, feminism has been a movement uncomfortable with individual agency. And again, this is something else which is very similar with what we see out there today, which is that, no, there is no such thing as individual agency, there is only the group and the government need to tell us what we do. So for many feminists, a woman is first and foremost part of the sisterhood, rather than an individual with her own mind and ideas. And this is why we see women who have a different point of view from, let's say, the organized feminist movement, women like Joanna Williams or Christina Hoff Summers or Candace Owens, who by the way, she's usually wrong on almost all the fundamental issues, but that doesn't matter. So when we see these women deviating from the collectivist line, they're being considered gender traitors. So basically, what we have here is to be a woman, it's not only about your biology or your experiences. No, it's also about whether you carry the party card of allowable opinion. And this means we see such weird situations as the first prime minister, the first female prime minister of this country, Margaret Thatcher, being characterized by many feminists as not even being a woman, that, that her woman status is questionable. Or we see how, in my opinion, the biggest philosopher, at least of the last century, or if not of way more, Ayn Rand, never being pre present in the pantheon of feminist heroes. Why? Because she was an individualist, because she saw herself as an individual first, as a person with agency of her own, rather than as part of the wider group. So what will the future hold? I predict new ideological divisions, which will also have an impact on the social movements. And these divisions have been shaping for some time, but I think the COVID crisis will make them clearer. So the division is not going to anymore be left or right. The divisions will have to do about something way more fundamental than politics. It will be about your existential view, how you view yourself, how we view men or women. Do you view them as capable? Do you view them as individuals first? Do you consider that they are able to live their life without the paternalistic state taking them by the hand and imposing all sorts of control in their lives? I think this will be the biggest division in the future. And I'm afraid that in this division, the feminist movement, again, as an organized movement, will be in the completely wrong side of history. Unfortunately for us, it might be the winning side, or, or hopefully not for long, but it will be the winning side in the long term, but it's not the right side of history. Thanks, Nikos. Uh, before we go, I'll, I'll ask one of my questions before we go to the audience. So uh, I think this is, there's a problem that feminists um, had before, before the pandemic, and uh, I'm wondering how, how they're going to deal with it and how uh, this might affect them. So when the, 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 there was the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings uh, and the, um, there was the accusation against him and the main message of feminists back then, the most trending hashtag was believe her. So if somebody, if a woman ex accuses a man, uh, you you believe her before uh, there's any you know before before 
a court of law. Sorry, Rising, believe all women, not believe yeah. her, believe all women. Yeah, yeah. And and the, the thing is now, um, there is another situation where a very prominent uh, figure in the U.S. is being accused uh, and is being accused of, of something, I think, uh, worse than what Kavanaugh was accused of. And uh, the Believe Her movement is, or, or Believe All Women or Me Too, is, is pretty silent. I mean, here and there you hear uh, some voices, but certainly the mainstream media isn't as behind the, uh, the woman who's making the allegations as they were uh, in the Kavanaugh hearings. Um, basically, I guess what I'm asking is, is this something they can uh, uh, sustain regardless, regardless of the, the, the pandemic situation? Is, is this sort of uh, you know, mixed messaging something they can sustain? How is it gonna, how is it gonna uh, work for them in the long run? Zoe. I just need to interject here because I think you're, both of you are sort of stitching together this slightly sort of unfair mis picture of the whole thing as if this feminist movement is this sort of octopus controlling the world, superpower, it's like destroying women's ability to be individuals outside of it. I mean, by your own definition, it's a movement. There are plenty of women who aren't in the movement and they're not threatened by feminists at all. Note that Margaret Thatcher freaking hated what she called women's libbers. The feeling was mutual. I mean, you don't have to, there's, there's, a, there's a false assumption in what you're saying or a false link between like all women are somehow in relation to feminism. A lot of women aren't in relation to feminism. Uh, feminism is a, a, the, the, and being in the sort of bubble as it were of academia or London or the media definitely causes you to overstate the power of this kind of feminist movement. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of women who maybe didn't consider themselves feminists certainly did relate to, to to sexual harassment and all the things that were raised in me too. But I think there's also a need to not, yeah, I don't, I don't really, this sort of vilifying feminism sort of doesn't sit well with me. It's actually quite a complicated, that's quite a complicated intellectual genealogy and has been used in many ways. So I think there are obviously extreme uh, voices um, who, who, are, who are completely barking up the wrong tree. I can see the problem with quotas and stuff like that. Um, but um, I suppose, you know, feminism being a, being a woman and being an individual aren't commensurate. So it'd be ridiculous to include Ayn Rand. I mean, Ayn Rand, there's, there's no way Ayn Rand was a feminist, just like Margaret Thatcher was a feminist. There's no way Ayn Rand liked feminists, just like there's no way Margaret Thatcher liked feminists. As I say, the, the, they don't, you know, until very recently, I think it's, I don't even know if that's still the case now. The vast majority of women did not say they were feminists. This is a very new thing, if even it is a thing. Um, which, by the way, has only been facilitated by capitalism, which I'm, in, I'm perfectly in favor of capitalism doing its thing. But like the I'm a feminist t-shirt, you know, it's a voguish thing, very much of the recent. I mean, really, everyone was not saying, most women in the history of the world were not saying, I'm a feminist. They were very, very, you'd be amazed how afraid women are of identifying with what they see as man-hating. I've heard it again and again, and I've taught school groups at the British Library. They all say... We're, I, one of the questions I always ask them, are you, do you consider yourselves feminists? And a lot of them are what to associate with feminism. And they, they are still uneasy to this day, you know, about the man hating and stuff like that. And I just also really wanted to just interject on Razi's thing about believe the woman being this kind of example of like uh, evil women dragging down the gross frat boy, Brett Kra Kavanaugh, who I have to say, like getting the violins out on his behalf. If you like me, have spent any time in the US and know what these frat boys are like it's hard I mean granted this is not a legal a legally strong argument or even logically but viscerally um but there's history at play here right like there is a very 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 indisputable and long-running history of women being raped and ignored and thrown on the slag heap and then punished further when it turns out they're pregnant and they're raped I mean there is a big history here which is why you tend to get these exaggerated slogans, which is all very well for us now to say, oh, yeah, I believe the women. Yeah, I can see, like, legally, it's not, it's not right to dob in a man who hasn't done anything wrong because just by a matter of, you know, course, you're, but, I'm, but I think that you cannot just pretend that it's completely, without context, equal playing field. History means that it isn't. For instance, Jews, speaking as one myself, a German Jew, no less. You know, if I would happily get behind a statement that was like, believe all Jews, don't believe any Nazis, or don't, sorry, don't believe any Germans, not that they're the same. It would be really wrong. Like, Germans are great now. But you can see that like there are certain, like his, the way things get loaded up, history matters, 
final plea, I think you can have, a, it's not as black and white in terms of this political, I think the problem maybe is that it's not a black and white political question, really. Um, yeah, and, and, and it's like- It's a black and white legal question though. I mean, you can't say- yeah, men have I'm great. Just going back, yeah, but I'm just going back to what Nikos was saying. Like, I think you can, this, this, this tension between sisterhood and individual, like it def like as if it's like a def it's an absolute black and white binary that locks you in one or the other. I think there are a lot of people who real talk would consider themselves, you know, in the sisterhood, but also individuals at the end of the day. And don't forget that, you know, if you know anything about feminism, it is since the seventies rooted in this kind of complicated idea of the personal is political. The personal is, in, is inevitably an experiential, subjective, individual thing. So it's complicated how the political and the personal and the individual, um, you know, relate to each other. That's all I would, I would say. Yeah, all right, over to the question. First of all, I totally agree that women and feminists are not the same thing. That's why I mentioned specifically that I'll talk about the feminist movement, which already has many shades, but it's some characteristics are, are core in a movement, even if it has different states. Uh, I would agree with Zoe that the Me Too, culturally, in terms of, let's say, the office culture and stuff, has been a, a force that has said light to important problems and important issues that were considered acceptable, whereas they should not cons be considered acceptable. So no disagreement there. But the problem begins when we reach the threshold of what Razi mentioned, which is when we reach the threshold of things such as the presumption of innocence, or when it reaches things such as our objective thinking, how we evaluate situations. So I don't know if you remember the exact cultural atmosphere during the Kavanaugh hearings, but I come from a country that has experienced political terrorism, lynchings in the streets, riots, we are the Disneyland of rioting in Europe. I've never seen in my life such a toxic atmosphere as during the Kavanaugh hearings. It was something which was disgusting. So I would expect that this time, I wouldn't say that what Biden is accused of is worse or better, or I, I don't want to put them in, in, in who was, what was worse, what, Dr. Ford accused Kavanaugh or what this, this, this woman accuses, accuses Biden. But I, we can agree that the reaction is completely different, right? And this means what I said, that in these movements there's always a political agenda. That it's not that this is now a woman who is speaking up, which would be the individualist approach. Let's see what her claim is. There's this thing, oh, who are you accusing? What does, your, what does your party card say? And that's why the reaction is different. And we've seen many examples, which I don't want to generalize, maybe they're outliers who said that even if this happened, even if this happened, it's better to have Biden in the White House than Trump. I mean, how, what? Imagine someone saying last year, even if Kavanaugh did that, it would be important to have in the, in the, in the, in the Supreme Court someone who is pro Second Amendment. That would be completely unimaginable. And yet, because we live in this public sphere where the one narrative is considered acceptable, and again, this is, a, this is a minority, I understand this, this minority is not representative, but the lack of outcry means that a lot of people within that movement are thinking, is this the hill I'm gonna die on? Is the hill I'm gonna I, die I, on I, I, I agree. the I guy think, who could beat Trump? I just think that, here you glossed over oh it doesn't matter which is worse i think it really does matter i think biden's uh, alleged crime is less bad than kavanaugh so i think i think that is a reason that there's less outrage completely if i'm uh, if i'm wrong and if i'm wrong yeah i might be i might be wrong but yeah go on isn't anyway i know i don't want to end the detail, i thought he so. just like i thought there was i mean here i'm so back uh, behind on american po i can't bear anything to do with american politics but i thought it was kind of finger penetration. Yeah, but... That's different from gang rape to on an unconscious... Oh, no, no. Uh, no, Kavanaugh wasn't accused of uh, rape. Kavanaugh was accused of, of getting oh. on top of her and shutting yeah. her mouth. other people raped her, yeah. No, 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 there was no rape involved. Okay. It was an attempt. No, she, she was afraid that this could be an attempt. I mean, even if there was no attempt, that's already assault, okay? That's already a big problem. 
but that's why I don't, I don't want to put them in, in what was worse. In my opinion, both of these things are horrible if they happen. So it doesn't matter. You can't they're... say, yeah, you as a man really are on thin ice if you say which is worse, but I think one is worse than the other and that there is just a visceral... Anyway, we, we can get off the... Yeah, but I think we have a disagreement on what was the official thing that happened. I think the official accusation of Kavanaugh was basically... Uh, it, it didn't come close to it. But anyway, that, that's not important. Yeah. yeah, when I was saying that what Biden is accusing uh, accused of is worse, I was referring to what Nikos uh, said Kavanaugh was accused of. I wasn't, if, if, it, if he was accused of gang rape, then no, that, that is worse. Oh, yeah, we can put things into, you know, into scale of evil, but that's not the point here. The thing is, if, if it was the other way around, the reactions would be exactly the same. That's why I'm saying that this tribalism has also obviously penetrated most social movements. And it's not a surprise that it also penetrated the feminist movement. Because otherwise, you would say this requires equal outrage. And actually, the corroborating evidence, which is only that evidence, because Biden is as well innocent until proven guilty, you could say that this time there is more stuff out there. And again, we can never know what happened. The only people who can know what happened is. Is, is basically if it can be decided by a court of law, which I don't know if, if maybe the time has passed and this is not the case. But what I'm saying is the reaction is clearly different. All right, we have a couple of questions in the queue. Uh, and so the first question is from Ella. You are unmuted. Um, so I would just start with some observation I have. Um, so first is in my university, there's this uh, society called Women in Business and it is one of the most famous society and it receives a lot of funding. And um, another observation is that um, McKinsey has a program that tailor only for, for women. So they're going to say something like, if you are a woman, you are invited to this event and that event to learn more about us. And then um, the other day I uh, was reading my email and then there's some new report about how female entrepreneurs dealing with uh, the COVID world. So from all of that, I, I can see that there, like women is, so there's a lot of attention on how women is doing and it's more like a, a cultural aspect uh, of us to focus on women. We want to help women and we love women. We have International Women Day. And apparently there is no male equivalent version of all of those things. So I just want to ask, um, what is your opinion on these women-centric initiatives? Do you agree with them? And do you think there are any relationships between feminism and this cultural aspect? Um, does this cause feminism or does this cultural aspect cause some person to be uh, moving to an extreme uh, continuum and to be an, a feminist. Nikos. Okay, so... <sighs> okay, first of all, I, I'm the opinion of a private company could do whatever that company wants. If a company wants to say, if you're a man and you show up to work, we're going to throw you potatoes, whatever. So I'm not... Any criticism I'm going to make is based on not whether a company should do these things, I mean, if they want to do it, more power to them. I mean, the femme power things. But uh, I, will, I, will, I will still criticize them. So as one of the audience said in that uh, battle of, in, in a discussion, I've taken part of the battle of ideas this year. What happens in many big corporations is when you're a woman, first, first day at work, go to that room where we kind of celebrate each other and we empower you. If you're a guy, go to that room so we're going to teach you how not to be a horrible person or a rapist or whatever. So that's already happened, something which I find a bit weird. The second thing is, why does this happen? Well, because, again, feminism and mainstream ideology have a lot of things in common. Because feminism today, as opposed to the 60s, or as opposed to the suffragettes, or as opposed to, li to some truly liberal feminists today, like Christina Hofsommers, the feminist movement is not radical. So it's actually, it's one of the pillars, it's ideology, it's one of the pillars of the mainstream ideology. Because as I said in, in my introduction, they share a lot of things in common, including how they see human beings. 
But I think that these kind of micromanaged empowerment events are, first of all, not useful for an ambitious woman. And let me give an example. Could you ever imagine Margaret Thatcher, or if you don't like Thatcher, let's take a leftist. Could you imagine Golda Meir going to a empowerment meeting in her company? Now, who was Golda Meir? Golda Meir was the leader of Israel who one morning she woke up and the Mossad told her, Madam Prime Minister, three, uh, uh, three hostile or two or three hostile nations are attacking us and the survival of Israel is in danger. And Golda Meir was leading a council that had generals like Moshe Dayan, the legendary, the legendary guy of the Israel army with the guy with the eye pads. So imagine you're a woman on a war council with all these men who, believe me, were very strongly opinionated because they have fought fights for Israel that basically uh, secured the existence of states of Israel. And there you have a woman banging her, her hand on the table and establishing her opinion. That's empowerment. And you cannot get empowerment in these kind of corporate, oh, we'll come together and we'll do these activities. No. Empowerment means you have a vision, you have an ideal, you have values, and you go out in the world and you pursue them. That's why my biggest criticism to these events is not that they are anti-male, although some of them are, it is that ambitious, independent, and value-driven women do not need them. Before we go to Zoe, I have to say that if I was going to make a list of uh, women that you know, we should celebrate, Golda Meir would not be on that list. Absolutely not. Uh, and just to correct Ella, there is an International Men's Day, I think it's sometime in November, but all the other things, oh, there's International Everything Day. Go on Twitter and check the trending hashtags any day. It's International Pancake Day, or uh, yesterday was International Nurses Day. So it's international some kind of day every day, and one of those is for men. But all the other things you mentioned, hey, any company that uh, does specific uh, things for men, celebrating men, will absolutely uh, have trouble. Yeah, just to mention this one thing, Razi, there have been attempts by some men to celebrate in the workplace International Men's Day or Father's Day, and they have been heavily criticized. So again, I'm not saying we should celebrate Men's Day. I would abstain from such a celebration for the same reason I criticized all the things I've been criticizing up to this point, but I'm just mentioning for the discussion. Zoe. Um, ugh, Razi, come on. Like, Golda, like, I love Nikos's description of her. I was like, yes, yes. I mean, this is like, yeah, no, I, and I have to say, um, you know, I like obviously Margaret Thatcher as well, but I do also really like, I mean, you, you gotta be more flexible. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> her country was almost annihilated because of her horrible decisions uh, that she made during that war. So well, I, I mean, sadly, again, I actually, I'm probably too skimpy on the details to like battle you on that. Um, but I think like, okay, so basically I, in my soul, I agree with Nikos's definition of what real empowerment looks like and should look like for women. And that it, in a way, if all things being equal, the woman with the ideas and the creativity and the and the and the kind of drive will achieve what she sets out to achieve because she's so into it. But that all things being equal is the thing that you've glossed over. And I think that again, I re return to history. Um, it, it really there's a reason to Ella's question um, that there are these things because it's not think it's not all things being equal. You know, in the 70s, women couldn't take out mortgages. Um, a single woman can take, and women can take out mortgages without husband's permission. Uh, they couldn't get credit cards. Um, they were treated in ways by doctors that would make your just, you know, your skin crawl by modern standards. So I think it's really important not to lose sight of the really seriously grim, difficult, like blatant, rampant things that were holding women back until quite recently. So now, of course, like. If we're where we are, in, look, if you're a woman in Calcutta and you're lower class, like the picture's not pretty either. But if you're like in London, like in, the, you know, things are, things are better now. They weren't as late as the 70s. The other thing I would just say to, to Nikos's answer to Ella's question, you know, 
as you know, I, I'm with you. I like going straight for the kind of Golders and the Margaret Thatchers and even the Ayn Rands, even though I'm really not an objectivist and I, I certainly wouldn't cite her as the best philosopher ever. Um, but I do think there is this famous, you can't draw that much from the kind of occasional alpha, que the queen phenomenon really, which is that for, you, know, you can't say early modern England didn't, wasn't sexist because there was Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth was immensely powerful and a very, very particular set of circumstances enabled her to, to, to well, meant that she was queen. And then once she, once she was queen, it was a very strange kind of all bets are off thing. Same to some degree, although differently with Queen Victoria, um, sort of. Um, so, so, and I think with Merkel, you know, there are all these female leaders, but I don't think you can then say, you know, these, these women are what we can all, we, it's, that's not the norm. And I think that these this, this idea of empowerment is being bullshit when it's like in the boardroom at work, but real when it's your head, the head of state. Um, tempting though it is, I don't think that is actually reality, which is that the vast majority of women are just like men, which are, they just try to go through the world and they get scared easily, just like men do or put off or, or sort of doubt themselves. And I'm afraid to say that, you know, discrimination is, is alive and well. And I don't mean sexual harassment. I mean, the assumption, especially among baby boomers, that, that women are the ones you go to to talk about your grandkids and your kids, but not to just treat them with professional respect. Um, so I think that probably in none of us work in, I mean, Ollie maybe does, but we, I don't work in a corporate office. I know from my mother, who's a lawyer in a very male pharmacy, kind of biotech area that she, and she's not a, fem she's not, she's not a feminist. But she, I've I've been very prey to the kinds of discrimination that are based on, you know, some, so so I'm just saying that I can imagine a world in which actually the vast majority of women could do with some hand holding. Um, I don't think it's good if that then means men you're all rapists and stuff. But don't forget, traditionally the men were being hauled into the other room to like be taken out to a strip club, be like gross bros, grope their colleagues. I mean that was literally what it was like until. I don't know, 10 years ago, it was like that even when I first worked for a financial newspaper in the city. In the, like, so, so again, like, it's just important, Ella, I would say to remember, right now things may seem a certain way, but corporate culture, workplace culture, and all that kind of stuff, like there's a reason these things developed. And yes, there may very well be, they may have gone in the wrong direction now, and there may be like excesses of them. But again, yeah, that's just my plea for history. Can I add something, Razi, because it's, it's a genuine question. So for the records, I think that what Zoe said is correct. The question is, how did, and, and actually quite often I see Greek TV series, even from the early 2000s, not even from the 90s, and, and, it's like, and there are scenes where you think, to use another term that I hate, this is really problematic. This is like gross, this is horrible. So I agree. But the, the interesting question is, how did that change? And again, I haven't got an agenda with that question. It's a genuine question to, to Zoe. Did this change with these campaigns or did this change through something else, you think? I'm not sure. I actually think campaigns are a little limited because it's very easy to ignore campaigns. I think things gain critical mass and then, have, and then change culture. It's about cu how, what can change culture. And culture changes when, for whatever reason, a trend, something reaches a kind of tipping point. And Me Too is a very good example of... of that and I think before me too it was just a slower process where you know women like women's networking was laughed at but it still went on and then something happened in culture um in the mid to late 2000s maybe where people just got took it more and more seriously and men got on board I mean that's actually a really good uh, <laughs> it's really good point I'm about to make um like you do need complicity from the other people to make, so patriarchy, if you believe in that concept, is only sustained because women are on board with it. Hegemonic masculinity is only sustained because non-alpha like non males prop it up. So any kind of change in this culture around what's socially acceptable, what's culturally acceptable, and therefore what's culturally taboo now, will only have succeeded because men have got on board with it. Um, so actually, that's really a question as to why men, why do men, why do men now call themselves feminists? I mean, that's fine. 
but it's definitely a new thing. So it is there's something there about about men, I think, being mm. enabling it to happen. Uh, the next question is from uh, from Eamon. So I have a quick clarification on uh, the information surrounding Kavanaugh and then I have my question. So what confuses the, the situation with Kavanaugh is there was actually there was multiple accusations. Um, the the main <clears throat> the main one by Ford was that he pinned her down and groped her and was stopped by his friend. Um, but that got, got, got mixed in with, there was some sub, subsequent um, accusations of him being in some kind of group that were going around gang raping girls. And I think that was, um, yeah, n n even the media I don't think found that particularly credible. But anyway, so the, my question is, do you think that the people who I think rightfully uh, point out some of the excesses of the feminist movement and uh, point out some of the uh, objectionable views that some of those people have are exaggerating because if you if you, you know, and, and those those kind of people I think spend a lot of time on Twitter and online uh, listening to most to the most extreme proponents of um, those views uh, if you go around in the real world you'll find that uh, as Zoe said, most women, I think, I think the, the statistic is most women in the in the UK do not call themselves feminists. And even if the ones, even when you meet people who call themselves feminists, you find out in real life that most of them are pretty reasonable, That's, at least in my experience. Uh, and the ones who are pretty extreme are, you know, uh, even they're, they're not as extreme as the ones you'd find online. So I think there's something about the online culture which makes things a bit more extreme. And then a second sort of part of that question is, are there any things that you would say that you that have improved because of the feminist movements from your perspective in the last 30 years? Zoe. Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right that the perception of feminist, like that's what I said, it's like this octopus-like force taking over. And, and I think with Me Too, it, that wasn't just a perception rooted in, in cosmopolitan Twitter land. It really was taking over. Uh, for better or for worse, in many cases for better, in some cases for worse. Um, but I think generally you're right. I think actually it's the way with even some of my most detested, wokey, woke mathon people who are just awful on Twitter and just, ugh, I rage at them and I call them, whatever. It's funny because like actually in person, some of the, it's a very small proportion of those types who are actually bad or insufferable in person, so yeah, I think that I think the, the threat of that of that extreme I think I think extreme feminism is perhaps overrepresented among certain li labor um, people who were prominent people who were prominent in the Labour Party, Corbyn's Labour Party with large Twitter followings. I think that's I think that's right. In terms of feminist contribution, I mean, one of the most interesting questions of feminism is what does feminism actually what what can we attribute to feminism so there's it's not in any way a clear-cut question about whether fem suffragettes got the vote it helped the suffragettes definitely didn't because they were blowing things up the suffragists with their slow campaigns and they may have helped but at the end of but but actually it some people say look no it's just world war one like women did all the work at home, on the home front while men, the men were away it just felt that that was the time to kind of reward this campaign so it's probably actually both but it's never like feminism alone achieved these outcomes likewise i mean i my instinct would be like yeah i'm very glad that i can have an abortion on demand that i can decide when i can decide about my reproductive future without any censure or punishment i think that is one of the most fundamentally brilliant things that has that you could i you know i would never live in a country where those things are in any way imperiled um but is that the feminist movement's work mm, prop i don't know i mean all those 1960s um kind of things about the pill and abortion and then 1970 equal rights act and then anti-discrimination act in 1975 those might be reversed i can never remember that's like you know, male-led governments making these laws. I mean, yeah, there, there's like the odd woman there, but but it, that's not them thinking, oh, the women's liberation movement, which by the, which got going in 1970, the women's liberation movement has caused us to make a law. So on that front, it's very hard to know what is precisely down to women's liberation. 
probably what feminism did, and which I think is a good contribution, is that it, it, it really did give a new language for expressing these things. You, you cannot believe how much was inexpressible about these matters. Like not only women talking about their, describing their bodies, say, in a, in a medical setting. I mean, the shame associated with like talking about your private parts, even in a medical context, was like extreme. You know, so, so, there, so there wasn't even the language for that. There certainly wasn't the language for how you would describe these like subtle forms of being undermined or not even that subtle, or how would you say actually being constantly harassed and chased on the Euston Road every time I just come out for two minutes to try to hail a taxi is not okay? How would you say that? People would just laugh at you and say, you're being, I've seen it in magazines. I've done a lot of research on, on the 1970s. So, you know, I've seen male magazine editors just say, stop being so silly and humorless, you shrill spinster bitch, essentially. So, so there just wasn't the, the lingo for how you express things not being okay, how you talk about things going on. And then just the language of rights. I mean, look, that's a really problem. People way abuse rights now as a, as a thing to have on every possible front. Um, but, um, but, but all that kind of like thinking about equality, thinking about, by the way, I think equality is a problematic term as well. But, but there wasn't even, to how you talked about domestic, work and emotional labor and all these ideas that that started to describe women's lives very dreary lives these, these were not like women having a lovely time complaining in the 70s like really it wasn't like that it was it was like the doing all the work yourself with the kids the cooking the cleaning the man's in the pub doesn't live comes back beats you i mean that that was kind of what it was like for a lot of people so feminism gave the world a language um, gave women a language and men picked up on it but were often quite rude about it in which to like start exploring these new like personal issues so you know some of that obviously has run totally out of control uh and but but i think nevertheless it yeah that's the level on which i would say we can be sure feminism and also razzy's like barfing in his mouth as he thinks about feminist like lingo and it's like but even you are benefiting from it because you need to have these things that put ideas in place that you can then rebut if you want i think and i just don't think there was that before yeah it depends on the ideas and it depends on whether or not the the, the lingo represents them accurately um nikos and then we'll go to our last question yes because there's a good question also in the chat so the mere fact that the subsequent accusations about Kavanaugh even were made the news is a testament to the political agenda. Like there was this particular woman who made this unbelievable accusation that Kavanaugh and his friends gang raped her many times in consecutive parties. So the idea is I would go to that party, Kavanaugh was there and would gang rape. The mere fact that this issue which was clearly uncorroborated even by logic like you go to a party you see these people and oh it's going to happen again and no one no one did anything and no one called the police so the mere fact that this saw the light shows that there was more to these stories than just the mere fact that this was a woman versus a guy who was potentially an abuser there was political agenda there anyway uh, on the fact that, yes, the, 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 the loudest voices are heard on social media. Yes, but this doesn't take away what I believe, which is that at least the, 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 the let's say, the, 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 typical idea, the, the typical view of feminism is the mainstream today. And let me give you an example. Some, time ago, some months ago on TV, some female TV presenters made fun of these Room of, of this woman who said, I want to, you know, my dream is to be a stay at home mom. And you could see like th these, these, these women in the media making fun of her. Because why? Because how dare she fall outside of what it means today to be an empowered woman? You would never see the opposite. You would never see three women who were, let's say, traditionally conservative. Not that, there's a, not that there's any merit in being one. I'm not saying, you know, but I'm just, I'm just saying you'd never see three Tradcon women making fun of a woman who would call on someone to be a career uh, a career but, woman. Hey, you, Zoe you, wants you, to jump in because I, I just have to say one thing, which is that you absolutely would. All of history 
like, well, not of the 1950s. If you've ever read things like the women's, I mean, the, the derision of anyone who seemed to be a woman's liberal or a career woman was huge. Spinsters, wombs drying yeah, up. Like, so I just, I just think you're right now, maybe, but you're polar opposite wrong about, about that, about that dynamic actually up in the, right through the 80s and 90s. I'm talking about now. That's why, and, and that's why I agree with the things that you said, that these were very bad things that were happening till some decades ago. Now, again, my question is, and I'm open to the answer. I'm not saying there is an answer. I'm not, don't say I'm having the answer. Was this behalf of women who stood up for, let's say, their weaker sisters, which is something which is honorable, or was it women themselves who were the victims standing up? Or was it also, as Zoe said, that also men realized that, you know what, this is gross. However, I see in, in culture today that there is this idea that we always prefer that we solve these problems not by standing up to the bullies, but by this kind of micromanaging by the people who know better at the top. For some reason, which I still don't know, one of the most controversial things that I've said that have triggered people was that the best anti-bullying policy is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because you teach a lesson to the bully. And I will stand to it that this is, this is not mean that you blame the victim if they're a victim. So to put this in, in, the, in the situation of, let's say, sexual assault, it is important that women stood up to it. At the same time, it's very honorable if as a woman, you know, you stand up and you say, peace off, you're a creep. Or if he, you know, if he touches you, you give him a, you know, you, 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 you defend yourself. So I don't see why the one is, has to be contradictory with the, with the other. So yes, I believe that the feminist movement has helped. At the same time, I believe that women themselves as individual women stood up to people who were creeps or abusers. And at the same time, the whole society changed. And I believe that these things can happen at the same time time and we should not prioritize the one over the other so we should not say for example that the woman who or the women in the united states who are pro guns and everyone says no you have to teach men not to be rapists don't teach women how to fight well in my opinion the second is way more effective because good luck teaching 150 million or whoever billion people not doing bad things why is it bad someone taking agency in their own hands if someone is a criminal, right? So there's these discussions that it has to be the one or the other, where I think usually the, the, the changes are a result of all of these things happening together. We have time for one more question. So Noi asks in the chat, uh, there's a theory that after every extreme event in history, it's necessary to go to the other extreme to reach the middle eventually. So for example, uh, after the Holocaust, an extreme intolerance of anti-Semitism was needed. And after uh, most of history, uh, and still today in some places, women are raped as a matter of routine. Um, absolute intolerance for men's harassment is necessary until we reach a desired situation. Otherwise, there will be no change. Do you see any sense in it? And do you agree? Uh, let's start with Nikos this time. Okay, so empirically, I get what you're saying. But I don't necessarily agree because I see something which is, it takes away individual judgment on what happens in each particular case. So no matter what was the norm before, if a guy is a creep, if a guy is, 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 is you know, is, is touching or is doing things that we, you said, no, don't do it and they do it. No matter what the cultural climate is, he should be just based on the merits of this case. If he has done something wrong, he should be punished. If he hasn't done something wrong, the fact that men were creepy for decades doesn't say anything about that particular case. So, for example, on the issue of after the Holocaust, the, thing, the, 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 the solution is you respect individual rights and you attack collectivism and racism. That's the solution. I can't see what would be the opposite, let's say, extreme. The opposite extreme is that you criminalize Holocaust denial, which in my opinion is wrong, because it shows a disrespect again for understanding what rights mean. Someone has a right to be a, a ridiculous and a horrible person. Has, someone has not got a right 
to tax you in a way that you don't want to be taxed. So I don't see this as an extreme. What we need to clearly define is what constitutes a violation of your personal integrity and of your rights. And that's where we draw the line. We don't have to go to one extreme or another extreme. Because to be honest, I don't believe in extremes. If you're an anti-Semite, you are immoral. If you're an anti-Semite and you attack people, now you're a criminal. So I think things are, can be specific. So I don't want to use the language of, of let's say, extremes. Zoe. I think that's uh, wise. And usually I would, I would get behind that and, um, and I should probably be less extreme generally. Um, I think about this, I think what you put your, what you've drawn attention to, Noy, is, is just a kind of, God, I, I mean, has anyone here read their Hegel? I mean, I really don't know. But this, I guess, I guess it's like just one of the theories of history, right? So actually, I don't even know if this is Hegel. It's probably someone else, but it's definitely, well, a lot of people. The pe- There's Marx, actually, to some degree. But, you know, the kind of pendulum, the dialectic, the fact that you move, um, you kind of like have make one swing and then you swing back. And But I think maybe a more useful term or you know for especially for thinking about feminism is backlash and it actually goes in a different it's interesting that you say oh, we're now on this kind of back we're backlashing against violations of women's rights but in the 90s you know really really good book by Susan Faludi called Backlash and it was actually the backlash against feminism so feminism had had its heyday heyday in the 70s and 80s and then there was this backlash um that was like clamping down on career women millions of books published showing like faulty science saying that women who choose careers over reproduction by 37 are committing suicide in droves and like all this kind of stuff. So I think that there is an element which, which puts Nikos in his, in his kind of bold Randianism, um, not, not to be confused with Randiness, Randianism, um, maybe, I, I don't know, I think there may be something inexorable about the way these things work to some degree. I'm not saying that that should displace agency or moral action, but I think that like, sometimes you are in a swing of history and an adjustment and over adjustment. And I guess I would say to what, um, you know, Nikos has presented a kind of very clear picture of how things should be. But the reality is, you know, you've said, no matter what the cultural climate is, we should things should be judged in their own merit, fine. But there is no such world in which the cultural climate isn't there and doesn't play an important role because humans are psychological. They're not just legal and they're not just moral, which is why, for instance, a lot of Israeli parents really don't like that their kids, a whole generation of their kids are going off with Germans. It's not that the German spouses they're choosing are in any way Nazis or bound up with the sins of their ancestors, but you know, the fact is the cultural climate is such that it's un, it's uncomfortable for them. They, in a way, they do hold it against them. Not as such, but it's there. It's not comfortable, even though, you know, fair, you know, what's wrong with Hans or Kurt? He didn't do anything wrong. It's just, it is just a psychological question. And that again, takes us back to this thing of, um, you know, believe all women. Again, there is a, there is a cultural climate and that, in it, and that is a result of a swing and a roundabout and an over-adjustment. That I think, I think you put it really well, Noi. I mean, I think it's an over-adjustment. And, is, and I, think, I think in some, whether it's necessary or not, that's human psych. I think I would go for a psychological explanation for that and say that, and also I think there, it feels, I can understand that and I, I can't condemn it out of hand, even though I recognize the like logic of and and probably mostly the right of what Nikos is saying. Thank you, Zoe. And uh, yeah, there is a cultural climate, and the Ayn Rand Center is here to change it. So I hope uh, you will join us at future events and join us uh, uh, in our fight to change the culture. Uh, you can uh, join the membership program on our website as well and uh, help us uh, put on more of these events. Uh, I want to thank both our speakers, uh, Zoe and Nikos, and I want to uh, just tell everybody that this Saturday there is no psychology event. We usually have an event on psychology on Saturdays. There isn't going to be one this week. They'll be back next week. So our next event is on Monday. Um, people who are who have been uh, longtime members of the London Ayn Rand meetup remember that we used to do events on uh, the logical fallacy that Rand identified as package dealing. 
that's going to be back this Monday. We're going to be discussing profiteering. Uh, is it a package deal? Uh, what's the problem with that term? What's the problem with the uh, cultural climate as it relates to profit? And our speakers for that are uh, philosopher Dr. Andrew Bernstein and um, lecturer in the University of Amsterdam, Robert Van Dortmund. So I hope you'll join us for that. Uh, and we will uh, see you next time. Thanks, everybody.